Good morning. Good Chicles, the country church, Marion, Texas. A short drive to worship the Lord in a relaxed atmosphere. Matthew chapter 1. I, just so you know, after church, I'm going to hook up my flatbed. I've got to go over to my in-laws and load up all the gifts that my father-in-law bought me <laughs> for Christmas. So I'm going to be busy this afternoon. Beginning in verse 18, Matthew records, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your word and for what it means to us. Father, we thank you for this advent in history, the greatest event ever to take place in the history of the world. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus willing to leave heaven to come to Mary's womb and be born and to live a human life, fully God, to, to purchase our freedom for us. We're grateful, Lord. Pray for your blessing on our worship time this morning. I pray for Dave and our praise team as they lead us. Help us to exalt you, Father. Lord, I pray for our pastor as he will come to bring the truths of this passage out to us, Father, for us to focus on and, Father, to remember what you did for us. And Lord, I pray that uh, your Holy Spirit would draw men and women of all age to the Lord Jesus today to meet him as Savior. We'll give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Mark. Well, on this fourth Sunday of Advent, turn to four or five people. Please tell them your first name so they'll know who they're worshiping with today. Heaven and nature sing 
and heaven and nature sing, and heaven, heaven and nature sing. Well, this morning we consider the birth of Jesus, and as we come to celebrate Christmas, many sayings abound. He's the reason for the season. Keep Christ in Christmas, or Merry Christmas. A lot of people have a lot of different thoughts concerning the Christ of Christmas. And we want to examine some of those this morning and consider what they thought. First, I think we need to consider Mary the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ, and what she thought. And the Bible says in Luke 1, 26, it says, And in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, Thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and the power of the Highest shall overshadow thee, Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. Now we have to set this scene to even come close to imagine what was going through Mary's head. You have to think about it. First, an angel appears to her. Now that would set you back a little bit, I suppose. And then he says, you're highly favored. God himself is with you. You're blessed among women. You found favor with God himself. And he's the one that has given me this message to deliver to you. Of all the women in the world, God has chosen you. Well, you have to know that this was some kind of bomb dropped upon her. And the confusion, wait a minute, God sees me as highly favored, but I'm going to get pregnant and I'm not even married. Then the angel explained all of it to her and how it would take place. So what did Mary think? Well, Luke 2.19 says Mary kept all these things and she pondered them in her heart. Later on, as Jesus was confounding the elders in the temple, it says, but his mother kept all of these sayings in her heart. Mary pondered all these things, but Mary believed. Now, think of Joseph and what he thought. <coughs> Verses 18 through 25 reveal that. And again, we have to grasp this picture. Joseph was engaged to a good girl, and he himself was an honorable man. He wanted to do things the right way. He wanted to do them God's way. And yes, he was crazy about her. But God's way was and is that they be married before they made love and had children. But guess what? 
he finds out that Mary is already with child. She was pregnant. Now, it's interesting, but Joseph didn't want to see her stoned to death. So he was prepared to do this putting away privately. He wasn't willing to expose her publicly. To shame her, to disgrace her was not his intention. So he decided to repudiate and dismiss or divorce her quietly and secretly. And that was his plan. But guess what? While he's thinking about this over and over, trying to do the right thing, an angel appears to him in a dream. And the angel says, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. She's not a loose woman. In fact, she's highly favored by God. And it's his child that Mary is carrying. His name shall be called Jesus, which means Savior, and he'll save his people from their sins. When Joseph woke up, he just did what God said to do. You know, it's interesting, but you're always safe when you do that. He woke up and he just did what God says do. He didn't debate. He didn't say, Lord, well, maybe we could work it out another way. He just did what God said do. How much further down the road we'd be if we had that same thought. Well, he had no union with her. The Greek text says absolutely celebrate until after the baby was born. Joseph trusted the word of God, and so should we. But there were other people involved. There were the wise men, and we need to consider what they thought. It says, When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, <clears throat> there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we've seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Born in Bethlehem. Prophecy fulfilled. And we see <clears throat> the wise men numbering three because of the three gifts that they brought. We see them as kings, although they were not actual kings, but Magi elevated to the positions of rule. But if you don't recognize them as kings, then we can't sing the song. <laughs> we three kings, how, how are you going to do We three Magi? I got in trouble for singing a rendition of that song. We three kings of Orient are smoking on a rubber cigar. It was loaded. It exploded. We two kings of Orient are. And did I get a whooping? Well, they may have not been kings, but here's the thing. They acknowledge Jesus as king, king of the Jews. Some people say they were students of prophecy. Others, that they were astrologers, for they saw his star in the east, the one that shined over the little stable in Bethlehem. Now here's the powerful part. And are come to worship him. That's what we're here for, they said. We're come to worship him. We're not here for a photo shoot. We're not coming to set up some type of alliance. We're, we're not coming to introduce ourselves. This is who we are. No, we're coming to worship him. You know, some people can't even imagine how much I love being in this place. You people are some of my dearest friends. The music is great. And I love the preacher. <laughs> but let me tell you something. 
I'm not here for any of that. I'm here to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And over and over again, we need to remind ourselves, as much as we love each other, as much as we laugh, as much as we share, you know, I'm here to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Well, They came to worship him. One day, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's what the wise men thought. But what did Herod think? The Bible says when Herod the king had heard these sayings, he was troubled. And all of Jerusalem with him. And when he'd gathered the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. You know, insecurity is a terrible thing, isn't it? You know, uh, I, I think of poor Herod here, and, and I'm reminded of Jack Taylor, who was the pastor at First Baptist Castle Hills before George Harris was there. And Jack Taylor said, I used to have this inferiority complex when it came to the Lord. Until I realized it wasn't a complex at all. I was just downright inferior. <laughs> but here, it's something else. Herod was a whole lot insecure what if this Jesus would very well rise up and take my place? It's interesting that there's probably a lot of people that are still worrying about the same thing. What if I might actually have to die to myself that I might really be alive in Christ Jesus? I'd have to abdicate the throne of my heart. I'd have to step off so he could sit on and he'd have his rightful place on the throne of my heart to rule and to reign. Well, paranoia was paramount, paramount in that day. And I think it's interesting when politics try to mix with religion Herod gathers the chief priests and the scribes, demanding of them the question, where is it that Christ is to be born? Can you imagine what Herod thought? But we also have the shepherds. Now, isn't it something we've gone from the rich men in the east to the lowly shepherds? In Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20, there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came unto them. The glory of the Lord shone, shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, good will toward men. And it came to pass as... The angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another, Let us go now even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. For all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherd. But Mary kept all these things, 
pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen <coughs> as it was told unto them. Here were simple men doing a menial task of tending sheep. And on top of that, they had the night shift. <laughs> now, this angel shows up and God's glory saturates the countryside. Guess what? They were scared to death. You see, this wasn't a, a common occurrence. This wasn't, oh, oh, the angel's here again. Things are going to light up now. Can you imagine them seeing the angel? Flooded with light in the middle of the night. Wow. No, this is probably like, whoa. What have we done? Are we going to be punished for grazing in the wrong pasture? What's up? <clears throat> and I love the angel's response. Listen, don't be afraid. I am bringing you guys some really great news. And it's going to bring you and others great joy because this very day a Savior which is Christ the Lord is born <clears throat> and you go and here's what you'll find here is the King of Kings Lord of Lords God of all glory born in a lowly stable don't you know that confounded and confused every angel in heaven that Jesus would leave all the splendor and glory of heaven. You know what heaven looks like? I don't either. But I guarantee you to think of leaving there and coming here and being born in a lowly manger. Well, I'm bringing you some good news the King of kings, Lord of lords, God of all glory, born in a lowly stable. Jesus reached the rich and the poor. And the amazing thing is, the shepherds were never the same. You know, that's a, a, a universal thing down through the ages. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. When people come in contact with the Lord Jesus Christ, I mean really, personally, intimately. Their lives are never the same. <coughs> Verse 17, And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. Verse 20, And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. When you really, really meet Jesus, things will change. You want to share his sweet salvation. You're going to want to praise him, just like the shepherds. You know, Dave, I, I really don't think they had a choral tryout there. Okay, now we're going to see how you guys really sing before you praise Jesus. Buddy, let me tell you something. They cut loose, and they started singing praises to the Lord. And that's what we ought to do. You know, I couldn't read a note if it was written in German. But I, all those little squigglies, they're for somebody else. I, I, I can tell when it goes up, and I can tell where it goes down, but that's it. I don't know how long you're supposed to. Hold it. I just make a joyful noise and just cut loose because I'm not trying to please Dave. I'm trying to praise Jesus. And that's what he wants. And that's what we want. Well, it's not just what the shepherds thought. What did God think? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Ever ran in to get a last-minute gift? Now, don't lie to me, because you're in God's house (laughs) right now. Did you ever run to get a last-minute gift? Oh, man, I forgot so-and-so. She's my wife. (laughs) No. No, you think, I forgot somebody, and, and I've got to pick up something, right? Or do you say, well, I need to stop and bake them something, some homemade bread or something. Give me a break. So we're thinking, what are we going to do? Well, let me tell you something. God didn't do that. The scripture says, God so loved you. God so loved me. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Think about this. God gave you his best. He didn't look around and say, this is a dysfunctional angel and I'll give him. He gave his only begotten son. He is altogether lovely. And we sing he is more precious than gold and silver and diamonds. For God so loved that he gave. You know, that's, that's why giving should be so easy to us. Around here we have a Christmas for Christ and we encourage people to realize that it's his birthday that we're celebrating. And the very best gift we give ought to be to Jesus. How'd you like to have a birthday party for you and everybody was invited and they handed out presents and it was your birthday and you didn't get nothing? That's what we do. It's his birthday that we celebrate and our best gift ought to go to him. And with us, that Christmas for Christ, none of it stays here. It's not to help on the electricity bill. It's not to to pay the staff. It's not to do any of these things. All of it leaves here. And it goes to all the missionaries and all the missions that we support. And it's something extra over and above that we give them. And that's what Christmas for Christ is all about. And we give because he gave. But at my highest, I cannot even imagine what God thought. Because his ways are so much higher than our ways. Paul writes to the church in 2 Corinthians 8, 5. He said, and this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. We're not going to give this way until we give this way. Give ourselves unto the Lord. And that boils down to what do you think? We've considered a lot of things this morning. What Mary thought. What Joseph thought. What the wise men thought. What the shepherds thought. What God thought. But it really boils down to what do you think? What does it mean to you? How will you respond to what you know to be true in your heart? You see, God has given us the Lord Jesus Christ because he's not willing that one one person perish, but that all might come to repentance and faith and trust in Christ. And the Bible says that all have sinned, all me, all you, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
There is none righteous, no, not one. And if there was a way to be saved apart from the shed blood of the Lord Jesus, then God the Father is the meanest person in the universe because he allowed his only begotten son to die for your sins and for my sins. The wages of sin is death. Thank the Lord it doesn't end there. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of life, eternal life, is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. How do you be saved? You realize first that you're lost, that you can't save yourself. You ask him to forgive you of your sin. As you bow the knees of your heart and inviting the Lord Jesus Christ to come in and save you. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, I love to go out visiting, and yet I need to be careful like anybody else. I'll knock on a door, and some little kid will look out the window, and he'll say, come on in, Brother Butch. Mm -mm. Go get your mama. Go get your daddy. You know, and really we try to teach our kids, don't open the door to a stranger. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. He will not kick open, kick in the door of your heart. You have to open it willingly, invite him to come in. And when you do, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not hope so, maybe so, could be so, but no so salvation. This is the record. This is the authority that God's given to us, eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things written, have I written unto you that believe that you might know that you're saved and that you might believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And if you're saved, you ought not be ashamed of it. The only thing you've got to brag about is Jesus. And I'm not ashamed. I'm going to step up, step out, and I'm going to identify with Christ as a believer in baptism. Not to be saved, but because I am saved. And I have that desire to show the whole world but I believe that Jesus died for me. He was buried and he rose again. I am dead to myself and I'm raised to walk in this new life that he's given me. And then to plant your life in the life of a New Testament church. What a blessing it is. The time of the year. Today is the day of salvation. Harden not your heart is what the scripture says. Let's stand and pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for its power, its purity. We thank you for how it convicts us and how it comforts us. And Father, we don't know the need of every heart. We don't know the need of our own heart. But Lord, you do. And as you speak to hearts and reveal decisions that need to be made, Father, give people the courage to make those decisions. Lord, we'll be waiting at the front to receive them in Jesus' name. And Father, but we know that the wicked one will do whatever he can to keep people from coming to you. Father, would you cast him out of our services and allow your Holy Spirit to have access to every heart. And Father, we'll pray.